And welcome back to the second part of our programme um, and thank you to our clinicians in the previous panel um, for sharing with us um, their experiences and the impact on uh, cancer care and cystic fibrosis. So we're going to change tack slightly um, and to begin um, we now have a two-part panel discussion entitled Beyond Health, Do Well by Health, Do Well by Society and the Economy. During the pandemic, we have witnessed the intricate intertwining of public health and business, and public health and the arts and culture, sports and the charity sectors. Here to chair these sessions, we have invited Liam Fitzgerald to interview luminaries from business, arts, sports and the charity sectors. A UCD business alumnus, Liam is a senior and experienced chief executive of a large PLC in the pharmaceutical services sector with almost 30 years experience in international business. During his time as CEO of United Drug Group, the company transformed from an Irish pharmaceutical distribution business into a global healthcare services business, operating in over 20 countries and employing over 8,000 people. Last year, Liam became chairman of the UCD College of Business Irish Advisory Board. And we are delighted to have Liam with us this morning to chair these two panel sessions. So for our first panel, we are joined um, by Danny McCoy, CEO of IBEC, Imer McGrath, who's a partner at KPMG, Fergal O'Rourke, managing partner of PwC Ireland, and Fergal is also um, a, on the Council of the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland and is also a board member of the UCD Smurfit School. We also have Patrick Parr, who is a Managing Director of the Healthcare Division within Accenture Ireland, and Martin Shanahan, CEO of IDA, and also an adjunct professor at the UCD Michael Smurf Graduate Business School. So over to you, Liam. Thanks, Geraldine, very much for that introduction, and thanks to all the panelists who've given up their time this morning. I'd like to start by, by asking you about the future of work. Uh, there was a very interesting AIB survey published in the Irish Times a couple of weeks ago that talked about the fact that 80% of people surveyed didn't envisage or want to go back to work uh, for a five-day week type of working environment, which is sort of the for how we think about our working environment going forward. Um, so I think it's a really interesting topic to explore. So can I, can I start with, with you, Danny, on that particular point as to how employers are going to re-engage their employees in a post-COVID environment? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Liam. Um, I guess if you think about it, the, we, a lot of people can see the advantages of remote working now or a blended working life where you have the office and you have home. I suppose what COVID has done is changed the default position probably too quickly in the sense that, you know, there, there must be some balance. I don't know what the perfect ratio is. But uh, the shock, I suppose, was we went from uh, an option of 100% office to near 100% at home. And the difficulty is getting that pendulum back because it has huge knock-on consequences for obviously central bis business districts. But in time, we're also going to be running two parallel systems. Um, I think there's a little bit of um, blitz spirit about the operating from home at the moment that people are saying they're more productive, they have more blended lives and so on. But, you know, it, it, there's a corollary of bringing your best self to work now in many households you brought the office uh, to the household and i think those tensions will emerge over the winter so i must admit you know it won't be possible to do but i think it will be much better if we move from the kind of 100 percent office down towards that ratio as opposed to trying to drag it back up from the zero um, office environment but within, within there there is you know there is going to be a new normal but right now it's dislocation and I think the consequences of that, um, negative consequences, will emerge in the next couple of weeks. I'm seeing it already in a lot of our members. Uh, there is a sense in those surveys, Liam, as well, there's a bit of an attitude that they are my followers, so I must follow them, logic. Um, you know, leadership is about actually um, taking what might not be a popular decision right now, but there is going to have to be some of those conversations about uh, getting some critical and essential workers for for the culture of the organization as much as anything else back into an office environment. Everyone at individual levels may be able to function and be productive, 
but it's actually the sum of the parts which leaders uh, have to determine. Thanks, Danny. And Emer, you know, one of the things that interests me is whether we're going to be segmenting how we bring people back to work. In other words, is it going to be age or stage of life related? So we all might be quite happy to have, you know, young and healthy population back in the office doing what they always do, whereas we might be less sort of happy, as it were, in inverted commas, to, to have more vulnerable sections of our working community in the office. Did, did, how are KPMG thinking about that? Yeah, and that's um, that's a good question, Liam. And I suppose it's not even in, in terms of segmentation, as, as Danny said, at the moment, we're just reacting to what we have to do. We were thrown out very, very quickly. I think it's a testament to how we responded and how a lot of business have responded that we were able to go from 100% kind of in the office out. Um, when we look forward and we hope when we get back to this new normal or, or whatever it is, um, I suspect for us it will be segmentation, not based on age, but based on projects and tasks that we're doing. So I do think a lot of what Danny said is relevant for us in terms of we certainly, you know, probably won't go back to a situation where we were where it was before. And I do agree with that. I think we have to learn and take uh, from the lessons and how we've reacted to this. But I think there will be tasks that we will do from home where we can do tasks on our own. But there's such a huge need in, in professional services to collaborate. That piece about culture and, and our, we have um, 400 new trainees joining the firm in November and we have to integrate them into the firm and train them. We're, we're fundamentally a training firm. So I think it'll be hugely important that we deal with understanding how can we get them trained and, um, you know, how can we get them integrated? So I suspect work of the future might be segregated in terms of, you know, tasks that you can do remotely and tasks that you really need to come in in, in a team environment and that that'll be critically important. Thanks, Seymour. And, and maybe Fergal and, 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 and Patrick in that order. I mean, you, you guys rely as professional services firms on, you know, taking in talent from the university sector uh, into your organisations. You, you know, I, I have two nephews who are apprentices at the moment who both have lost out to a degree on, on some of the university education uh, and the collegiality that goes with that. And they're now being asked to work from their bedrooms, as it were, uh, you know, working eight hour days, but in an environment that is very unsatisfactory. So can you just tell us how you're thinking about keeping your, 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 your talent pool at an empty level engaged in your organizations? I'll come to you first, Fergal and Patrick, on that point. You know, first of all, we ran a very successful uh, intern program, a remote intern program this year, and the feedback we got was massively positive. So I think there are some learnings from the COVID crisis that we look to bake into our model going forward. But I was delighted to see that in the COVID uh, roadmap the government produced last Tuesday, that they actually had uh, a segment in there that allows people to come in for inductions. So certainly in PwC, we'll be taking uh, hundreds, I think we're the largest private sector uh, employer of, of, uh, for a number of universities. And we'll be bringing them into the office uh, in the coming uh, months and bringing in the people who will be immediately working with those. So, you know, it, it is difficult, the, the fabric, the culture of trying to make, to, uh, make sure you, you maintain that. And indeed, I had a session yesterday with our people who are one year in the office now. They spent half that inside the office and half that outside the office. And again, we got some great insights from them of what's working and what could be improved on, and indeed what we could do for the new intake. So yes, it is a challenge. Uh, and we are a, a data organization, we're a learning organization. Some people are predicting the demise of the office. I think they're wrong. Certainly in our case, uh, we're forming the view that we, the, the office is a good thing for learning, for collaboration, uh, for breathing the same molecules as everybody else and, and, and learning through that. But definitely there'll be a hybrid model going forward where you spend a good bit of time in the office, but you'll also be able to spend time working remotely or working smartly, as we say. So it'll be a life gym, but not as we know it uh, going forward from here on. Thanks, very much, Patrick. Yeah, I think it's very much uh, similar from our perspective. I think this has given an opportunity to kind of reinvent business models or reinvent um, traditional ways of doing things and um, with some positives and some negatives. And it's really about trying to get the right blend uh, between kind of face-to-face -face collaboration where you can get to um, really kind of meet and engage with your, with your, with your colleagues face-to-face, -face, but also as the opportunity to continue to work virtually. I think... I think um, you know, I, I, I never envisaged a day going back 
uh, five days a week and a virt uh, virtual first mindset is going to be embedded in all our cultures. And I think there's, there's, a, there's a challenge in all of us now to say, how do we continue to build the right culture in, in an organization um, in that type of model? And it's about trying to get the right balance, a hybrid model of a um, mix of kind of remote plus in-person in in activities. Right, and Martin, just, I mean, a lot of people predicting the demise of the city centre working environment and obviously Google's recent decision on the sorting office site, you know, a lot of people read with a, a sort of concern that was this indicative of maybe a potential challenge to inward investment in this country, which has been such an important economic lever. How, how do you think about that and any reflections on the Google decision? Uh, thanks, Dean. Um... Listen, I think, uh, firstly, I, I wouldn't read too much into uh, one uh, transaction. Um, certainly, I agree with um, Fergal, there um, will be a continued role for the office. Uh, there's a lot that we can all do uh, working remotely. We've all learned, I think, that we can do more working remotely than maybe was thought. But ultimately, um, companies will want people in offices for reason of collaboration, innovation, to build teams, to build uh, cultures, and so on. Uh, in relation to the outlook uh, for FDI, um, listen, you know, the commentaries have hurled, hurled at the end of FDI about every six months since I became CEO of IDEA in 2014, so I wouldn't panic just yet. Um, I think the recent uh, national accounts and revenue uh, figures show that it is uh, FDI that is actually showing up the economy at the moment. Uh, uh, we know that over 80% of corporate tax comes from multinationals and it's proving resilient. Income tax figures are proving resilient as well. That, that's partly a function of FDI. Um, having said that, FDI is not immune, obviously, to the impact of this pandemic. When I think about it, I, I think about it in two ways, I suppose. Firstly, the annual base of foreign direct investment, those companies we already have here, and, and they are certainly proving largely resilient, uh, particularly tech, pharma, uh, med uh, tech, uh, international financial services. Anything that is connected to maybe tourism, hospitality and retail, certainly uh, more vulnerable. And we see those sectors of our economy obviously suffering. Um, then we think about the flow of foreign direct investment. Uh, if I look at the first six months of this year, we had uh, 132 investments. That's down 6% on uh, last year. So not a substantial impact. That's not to say that that impact won't come because there is a lag effect. So I would be much more concerned about the next six months and indeed the 12 months after that. And we know that um, all international bodies are predicting um, very subdued levels of foreign direct investment, OECD, UNCTAD, both predicting the foreign direct investment globally warm, uh, fall about 30 to 40 percent. So, um, you know, again, Ireland and Europe won't be uh, immune to that. So I, I would say in summary, you know, foreign direct investment, uh, I think, uh, at the moment is proving resilient. Uh, it is uh, cushioning the economy to some extent, uh, the overall economy in terms of the impact of this pandemic. But it too, uh, obviously, aspects of it are suffering and aspects of it will suffer over the next uh, 12 to 24 months. And, and Mark, just one follow-up is, is, is just your thoughts on international travel protocols and because, you know, I'm, I'm guessing there must be a significant link between the ability to travel internationally and, and to attract and sustain investment. What, what, what are your thoughts on that and what do we need to do to restore international travel to some semblance of normality? Uh, yeah, obviously there is a link. Uh, you know, I, I often say that attracting foreign direct investment is a, a contact sport and uh, you know we need to be able to go out and meet uh, uh, investors and we need uh, investors to be able to come here and look at uh, Ireland and uh, you know uh, interrogate what they're investing in so of course it's important but in truth you know the uh, the reason that we're not able to do that at the moment is for reasons of restrictions here and indeed reasons of restrictions elsewhere and uh, I think a really fundamental issue is, is consumer confidence so uh, until, you know, people are confident to get on planes, their companies are confident in putting people on planes and traveling to other jurisdictions. Uh, it's going to be a feature of, um, you know, the way we work that we have to do more remotely. And that is what we're doing. And I, I think it's important as well that we, we don't fall into 
presenting maybe um, that as an example of kind of a dichotomy between health and the economy. There is an interdependence between the two um, and it is not possible to have consumer confidence and uh, normal economic activity return without suppressing this virus and protecting human health and lives. And in order to do that, we need to follow the public health advice. Thanks very much. Let, let me just come on to the topic of leadership. and we, we have about five minutes left, so I'm going to ask you to be brief in your answers, but uh, you may or may not have been uh, party to this morning's talk by Cathy Harvey from Said Business School in Oxford. Um, you know, we've had some, some conspicuous failures in leadership politically and in corporate life, not just in this country, but, but across the globe. Uh, we've also had some incredible demonstrations of what can be achieved when we pull together and it's very interesting, the sort of words that, that, that students in Saeed associated with leaders they respect and that we sort of did a, a survey on this morning with 200 participants were empathy, accountability, authenticity, honesty. The big loser seems to be do as I say, but not as I do, and directional leadership that fails and, and falls at the first hurdle. So my question is, you know, you're all leaders in your organization. What have we learned from this crisis about leadership that's really important to, to people who follow? And, and Danny, I'm going to come back to you on that one because you represent such a, a, large, a, a large body of the employers in this country. Yeah, thanks very much, Liam. I, I guess um, one point I made earlier on is it's very important as leaders, you don't fall into that logic of they are my followers, so I must follow them. Sometimes yeah. you, you have to try to take a position that's, probably not comfortable in terms of where things are moving. Um, um, so that, that I think is a more on the reopening and going back agenda. I think your, your direct point about when we had to handle it was speed and communications. Speed of response in terms of taking hard decisions to close down offices, to move out and try to keep communicating, but also have, I suppose, the humility to say, look, none of us know. We're all kind of guessing here. And uh, with that, I think, People are pretty, pretty good in, in pulling together even towards leaders who make mistakes. But if you do so transparently and uh, openly, I think you get a lot of benefit from that. Okay, thanks. And, and Amer, coming to you, I mean, is it possible to lead virtually? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, how do we inspire people online as opposed to face-to-face? -face? I know it's, um, it, it's certainly, it, it's new for all of us, but I, I, I think, um, I, I think talking to clients, um, you know, leaders have done a fantastic job in their organization in that piece of pulling people together. I think critical to that is things have pivoted away maybe from, you know, the focus. Um, we, we did a global um, CEO survey. It was just released last week and, um, CEOs have shifted from that kind of focus on the bottom line on shareholder return to really thinking about um, purposefulness and that piece that came up early in terms of empathy with your, with your people and really having a purpose to, um, to leading. And I think that's vitally important. So in a, a Zoom world, um, I think in terms of leadership, it's that trying to make the one-on-one -on -one connections with, with employees, not to forget about them when they're out uh, remote and trying to keep it going together. Um, you know, but but I think overall I'd be very positive with with, with how it has worked uh, so far. Martin, I spoke to you last week. You were back in the office. I mean, are you are you you know just responding to the question number one? But are you finding it you know now that you are back in the office, certainly part time, that it's easier to engage people face to face than it was online? Or, or how do you think about that? You're on mute there, Martin. Uh, so yeah, listen, I, 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 I'm, uh, just to be clear, I'm, I'm back in the office only when I need to be. Uh, we, you know, the entire organization has been working from uh, home remotely since uh, we have now opened up our offices in, uh, in Asia in uh, just uh, recently. Um, I, I think, um, you know, we've learned a lot during this period. Uh, you can, uh, I think you can do a lot uh, from uh, virtually. It is a dif uh, different. Uh, I think leading virtually, and uh, I suppose uh, you know in terms of um, you know what's important at the moment, I would say communication, communication, communication. That's that's really where it's at. Communicate with your team, uh, communicating with your clients, investors in our case, communicating with your shareholders in our case, the, the shareholders, the government, you know, and making sure that everybody knows where you're at. Can't stress that enough. Thanks, Mark. Now, do you agree with that, Patrick? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you know the uh, the principles of uh, leading your team in the office are are, are uh, you know the same can apply absolutely virtually. Um, regular engagement, uh, regular communication, empowering your your teams, and trusting your teams. I think is really really important that uh, they don't have to be. Um, in the office or you don't have to kind of see them face to face to kind of trust that they're going to get the work done and I think once you, once you have that trust and you empower employees to um, to kind of work remotely I think it, it absolutely can work as effectively uh, remotely as it, as it, as it does um, face to face. Yeah I totally agree with that and Fergal I'm going to finish up with you and, and maybe you can share a perspective on what it's like to lead your organisation in these challenged times. It's, um We've talked about communication already, and that's really, really important. But I think this is a time where in every organization, culture and values really come to the fore. And I suppose over the five years I've led PwC, we've really focused on the people agenda, on our values and culture. And one of the things that's come strongly back to us from the uh, surveys we've had since the COVID crisis, that we talk the talk in the good times, we're actually walking the walk down the bad times. And just as one example, very early on we went out to our people and we said, look, um, the partners, like the economic owners of the business, we will bear the brunt of this uh, financial crisis. And that for as long as possible, as far as possible, we're going to protect people's jobs and people's base pay. And the feedback we got from that was absolutely fantastic. You know, people sent in comfort at that, their jobs were secure, their pay was secure. And, and that generates massive loyalty, but it also indicates to people, you know what, this is an organization I can be proud to be part of, that you know, we're, we adhere to the values that we talk about day in, day out. So I think as I talk to various leaders on the organizations, you can see the ones where the culture is real, where the leaders are authentic, and that you know they, they, they are able to talk about it, but they're able to actually action it when, when times get bad. And I've seen a few organizations where the values and culture that they've talked about haven't really translated into the bad times. So I think There'll be a lot of studies to be written after this is over about culture and values and, and the importance of really cementing it in the good times and making sure that you can draw upon it when times are tough. That's a great way to, to finish, Fergal. I'm, I'm sorry we're a bit time constrained. I do see 34 questions in the, in the question box, but I think, uh, Jeremy, we'll, we're, we're going to move on and maybe come back to questions later given the time constraints. So can I thank this panel? Uh, hugely for, for your insights and, and your time this morning. I thought that was a, a really super session. Uh, we're going to move on. I hope you can stay with us, by the way. We have another very interesting perspective on the same topic coming up in a few minutes. But we're going to move now to a, a video, a short video, um, that I find really inspiring when I saw it first. And, and uh, it's, it's a, an initiative called Comfort for COVID that's been set up by a number of our MBA alums um, and it's a really outstanding initiative that has managed, you know, from humble beginnings to raise over 220,000 euros to place iPads and other tablets into nursing homes and hospitals to allow patients that can't interact with the outside world to connect with their families. So with that, Geraldine, maybe can I ask that somebody rolls the video? Excellent. Thank you, Liam. Back at the start of the COVID-19 crisis, reports of elderly and vulnerable people being taken to hospital, not knowing if they would get to see their families again was distressing. We wanted to help in some way. It was clear that technology could be used to help these people. We set up Comfort for COVID at the end of March with the goal of supplying tablets to hospitals and nursing homes all around Ireland, helping not only people who were sick or lonely, but also their families and frontline staff. At the outset, in many cases, frontline staff were using their own phones to allow patients and residents to make contact with families. But the use of one phone among so many people meant that they might be waiting a couple of weeks between calls. And on top of that, phone screens are quite small, they're difficult to use for older people. On a more systemic level, there exists a huge variation in availability and quality of Wi-Fi services across nursing homes and hospitals. And for the most part, neither the budget nor the resources are in place for the provision of IT services. To deal with these issues, we wanted to provide a solution that wouldn't require any setup effort on the part of the frontline staff, providing tablets that have both Wi-Fi and cellular connectivity. 
We redesigned and pre-configured the tablet interface to make them easier to use and allocated one tablet per 20 people, significantly shortening the time between calls with family. While initially we set out to donate 100 tablets to hospitals, the need in nursing homes became apparent very quickly. So we increased our goal to 1,000 tablets. To deliver 1,000 tablets necessitated the development of partnerships with the likes of UCD, DHL, Vodafone, 3, and many, many others. The success of these partnerships and our fundraising was dependent on building up trust through a transparent professional communication strategy. This was across traditional and social media, our web presence, our celebrity endorsements, and PR relationships. The impact Comfort for COVID has had in providing digital communications is thanks to the generosity of our partners and donors. Operating as a virtual team, we raised upwards of 235,000 euro in cash and resources. This has allowed us to deliver 1,167 tablets to 520 hospitals and homes all over Ireland. We have helped upwards of 22,000 people. As the levels of restrictions evolve, and even thinking beyond COVID-19, the tablets find many uses, like watching a favourite old movie, listening to music, or even attending the local mass virtually. There is no doubt that the urgency of the COVID-19 crisis has accelerated the adoption of digital transformation of medicine. This continuing transformation is important not only for the physical well-being of a person in care, but also for their emotional well-being. On St. Patrick's Day, Ben Thishuk Lee of Radker said that we are asking people to come together as a nation by staying apart. It's absolutely clear that technology can't and won't replace the need to hold someone's hand or offer them an ear when they're scared or lonely. However, in the face of the extraordinary challenges presented by COVID-19, technology does go a considerable way to maintaining human connection, allowing us to stay together while actually being apart. Can I, can I just say a very special thanks to Kira, Emma and Suzanne who set up this initiative. We're extremely proud of what they've done uh, from the perspective of the UCD College of Business. Geraldine, I'll turn it back to you to introduce the next panel now. Thank you, Liam. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a huge thank you to Kira and Emma um, and Suzanne, uh, the three co-founders of Comfort for COVID. Um, it's a stellar example of um, our alumni from our MBA programme having real impact and having societal impact. Um, so now, Liam, we're going to turn over to the second part um, of this particular session. We've heard from uh, the first part of the interdependence between health and the economy. Um, and now we're going to hear about collaboration and leadership within and across the arts, sports and the charity sectors, highlighting the interdependence between health and these sectors also. So what we have learned from this experience when we have been driven to the lowest levels unimaginable in the arts and sports worlds. And we are joined this morning in this panel session by Dr. Aina Falvey, who is Medical Director of World Rugby, Fergal Hines, who's Executive Director of Druid Theatre Company, and Stephen McNamara. Stephen is Director of Communications at IRFU and is also a UCD Executive MBA um, alumnus of 2019. We also have Una O'Hagan, who is Managing Director of Mar Pharmacy Group and also um, is a partner with the Peter McFerry Charity. So thank you, Talim, and over to you and your panel. Thank, thanks, Geraldine, very much. Uh, welcome, all of you. Thank you again for participating this morning and give it, giving us your time. Um, there's an undeniable link now that, that has come to the fore over the last number of months between our, our mental health um, and to some degree our physical health uh, as it correlates to our access to our creators and participants in the sporting arena, in the arts, and to some degree in the humanities and charity sector. Let me, let me start by asking uh, you, Aina, the, the number of the sports bodies we're highlighting during the week the sustainability or lack thereof of their business model in the COVID era for obvious reasons. 
where where are we going with sport and, and, and you know what role do you see it playing in our in our ongoing mental health and, and fitness um, and, and how do we resolve the, 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 the issues between funding and sustainability? Thanks, Liam. Yes, it, it, it's it's um, there are there are a number of factors in that question. I think the the overall question is is in the early phases of the lockdown, the the uh, the close proximity people had to stay within their homes and their inability to gather in public really shut down sport in, in completely and robbed robbed a large section of society of their of their ability to have an outlet and you know um an ability to, to 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 blow off some steam for want of a better word and and now that we're starting to see sport come back into the equation uh, people are able to get out there and, and able to train the sustainability of professional sport is largely in question now with the inability to have crowds and the difficulties that that is proving um with regard to our to plan and to uh, to, to try and prepare for 2021 in the absence of any knowledge around when we may or may not have a vaccine. So I think from, from where we are, we've recognised very early on in the piece that sport is, is facing the same challenges as any other kind of business. And in some, in some situations more, because international rugby, for example, requires an awful lot of uh, travel between countries. It requires bringing groups of players and teams into a country across across quarantine borders, et cetera. Uh, and this has been, this is, is really proving a logistical challenge. So right now, uh, you know, we saw at the Oireachtas Committee yesterday, we saw locally in Ireland, um, the, the sports come and say that if they, if, they, if they cannot get some kind of crowd going, if they cannot get the games going, they will be under pressure. And this is the picture we've seen right across the world. So at World Rugby, we're, we're, we're responsible for 120 nations playing rugby. Um, and, and that varies everywhere from Uganda, where it's a completely amateur sport, to Ireland and the UK, where it's a, it's a multi-million dollar business, as you can imagine. So what, what, we, what we did early on in the piece here was try and gather everybody together and get a look at what it looked like in every country and perform. And we, we basically created some guidelines with regard to how countries might be able to get back into sport. And um, we've had over 100,000 uh, usages of that of that. Um, platform which which we created online and you know in terms of just just echoing some of the the comments of the earlier panel discussion there being a, a focal centerpiece for individual unions uh, giving them someone to talk to we created we created a, a, a weekly and twice weekly meetings uh, of CMOs to get them together to give them the type of information they needed to help get back into the first phase and now the second phase is trying to recreate the economic model that keeps the sport going so rugby is very much from the top down so the international game funds the domestic game which then funds the amateur game at a lower level so uh, we're really trying to rebuild from the top down um, right now. Thanks Ian and just sticking with sport for, for, for a minute Stephen um, I know my mental health is going to be significantly enhanced by watching the game this afternoon uh, after this session but, but can you just talk a little bit about how you've engaged the playing, professional playing fraternity in, in the IRFU during the crisis, because you know there is nearly a more intense requirement for players, obviously, to maintain their diet and exercise regime and fitness. Obviously, uh, how do you do that remotely, and how have you risen to that leadership challenge in the in the IRFU? Well, it's a combination of both. Yeah, hopefully, I mean, uh, uh, I'm guessing you're you're going to be supporting Lancer today, so yeah, hopefully, our, all of our mental health will be uh, will be the better of that particular encounter with Saracens, I suppose. The challenge we had in relation to the professional game uh, was obviously very apparent quite quickly. Um, the moment we uh, realised that we weren't going to be able to play games, we had a number of, of, of players who are at the peak of their condition at this time of the year that we want to try and maintain for that. It's, it's really important when these people come back, not only from a physical point of view, but sometimes from a mental health point of view, that they themselves feel that they're on the top of their game when they're heading into you know huge games such as uh, the first game back being uh, Lunt uh, um, Munster and Leinster. So these are absolutely huge challenges for people. And what we've always tried to do, and I think what we do especially well in the IRFU, and probably one of the reasons why uh, the system here works so well, is that we work very closely with the player as an individual. Um, there is always going to be a, 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 a need and a focus on the collective when it comes to team sports, but also the individual is really important. I think in the IRFU over the last number of years, and indeed 
even with Aina, who, who, who spent many uh, years with us, hopefully happy, uh, before he headed off to world rugby, we, um, we made sure that there was always that link and that engagement between, between the player and, and the support systems around that player. Um, players love structure. They, uh, you know, they go from, from being you know, in academies to being professional players. And within that provides a huge amount of comfort for players because in some respects, nearly every element of what they have to do is and think about in some respects is taken off them. So from small things like, you know, getting uh, instructions on what to wear the next day to what you're going to eat to, uh, you know, meeting up with your nutritionist, meeting up with the doctors, meeting up with the rub men uh, to make sure that, you know, they're in peak physical condition. This also helps from a mental, uh, a mental standpoint and allows them to focus on what we need them to do best, which is perform on the pitch. And uh, I think over the years, we've, we've gotten very good at that in the IRFU and certainly in the new challenge of doing it um, remotely, I think we've looked at new technologies. Um, some of them maybe not that new. Uh, so, for example, uh, we're looking more at uh, working with players on platforms such as WhatsApp because the age group that we have, they don't really look at emails. and uh, Not too many of them uh, will uh, be, a, be across platforms like Twitter and things like that anymore. So we don't use those platforms very much anymore to direct uh, messaging to the professional rugby fraternity, but we do use um, the direct communication channels and also things like WhatsApp. Uh, and through that, I think we've been able to pretty much preserve in most respects, hopefully, um, their, uh, their mental well-being as well. A really important aspect of what we do as well with rugby players and through Rugby Players Ireland is look after their mental health through uh, having um, somewhere to go if they need to speak to people. So there is a helpline set up for players through Rugby Players Ireland and they have a very public and a very successful Tackle Your Feelings programme, which is directed at the rugby, uh, I suppose, professional player. But more than that, it's looking at, at the wider issue of mental health in, 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 in that age group as well, particularly when those challenges are for males. So we're doing quite a lot in, in that respect. Thanks, Stephen. And Una and Fergal, two more questions for both of you uh, coming up. I'll start with you, Una. Uh, you know, first of all, you're involved in a very, very, very uh, fine charity. Um, the charity sector is under severe stress at the moment. Uh, and I suspect, you know, funding models for charities in the post-COVID era is going to be as challenged as every other sector looking for funds. Tell us, first of all, how you think about that. And the second part of the question, which I'll say to you now, is you're obviously a, a, a prolific community pharmacist um, and uh, you're seeing and are at the front line of a lot of probably the, the follow through of uh, more sedentary lifestyles and, you know, uh, increased alcohol consumption, challenges with weight. So you might just talk to us about how you're thinking about that and how community pharmacy is reacting to that challenge. But let me take the charity point first. Okay, uh, thanks Liam and uh, thanks for uh, the invite to the panel this morning. So we've been working um, with the Marsh Pharmacy Group um, with Peter McFerry Trust for the last number of years. Um, I suppose one of our core values in, in our business, because we're very much embedded in the community, we like to give back to the community. But overall, we're in nine dis different communities across Dublin, but we wanted to do something that would have an overall um, that all of our pharmacies could get, give back. And we, we work with lots of, I suppose, local GA clubs, um, rugby clubs, uh, and so on in distinct communities. But overall, we've been working with Peter McFerry Trust for the last three years. Um, and you're dead right, Liam. I, I mean, the first problem that, um, that Peter McFerry Trust and all other charities had was their um, source of income really was taken away from them straight away because very often this is all run by events, balls, dinners, the likes, um, you know, to, to fundraise for them. And when we look at the activity that we have done over the last couple of years with them, that was all generated around events as well. So our last event that we ran for them was called Rapland. It was last Christmas. We raised 55,000 on that day for them. So, I mean, we couldn't run events anymore. So we had to really think about how do we help um, and how do we make sure that we continue to support them um, 
in, in the midst of COVID. So, you know, we very much at the call phase, as you say, Liam, in terms of working with patients, we could see what was going on day to day. But can you imagine what it would be like if you were homeless as well? And you didn't have access even to the information, the up-to-date sort of, you, you know, the changes in, in, in the advice and the education around that. So, I mean, we, we very quickly realised we needed to step up and, and play our part here. So, we, I suppose it was through the engagement of our team, and I'll talk a little bit about, um, I suppose, what we'd set up in the pharmacy to help our patients, I suppose, first and foremost. But one of those things that we had set up was a helpline, a helpline to, to, so patients could access information because very often they couldn't get through to their GP because their GP was taking COVID calls, they couldn't get through to the HSE, they couldn't get through to anywhere. So we, we set up this helpline to basically, I suppose, channel all of their queries to the most appropriate um, point of care. And very quickly we realised actually so many people were accessing the helpline because they wanted to be able to um, help other people on the front line. And we, we as you know, Liam, probably, we have a very, um, I suppose, a slick online service and what we noticed in the online uh, division of our business was normally about 10 percent of our customers would buy a gift for somebody else we noticed that hugely change through COVID, and almost 55 percent of our customers who were purchasing online were purchasing for someone else so that just shows you the kindness that was going on people were thinking about other people so we really started to think okay well how could we leverage this and how could actually we do something a bit different could we get a product that people could buy because people wanted to buy something to for other people and could we donate that the profits of all of that to peter mcferry trust so we could could we could we make it about a product that rather than anything else and that's when we went on the search for the giving keys giving keys is a uh, uh, I suppose it's a charity run out of LA. They employ homeless people in LA. They've been able to transition 130 people out of homelessness, give them a job, a second chance in life, and they make pieces of jewelry where it's just re-loved keys. So every piece is different. And they stamp a word, an inspirational word on that key um, that means something to them. So it's a pay it forward company. So they have words such as hope, believe, um, courage, you know, all inspirational words. And the idea is you buy the, the piece of jewellery, you give it to someone that needs that word at that time, and when they're finished with it, they pay it forward to someone else. So we got in contact with the Giving Keys in LA. They only sell in LA and in, in the United States, but they made an exception because obviously it was a homeless charity that we were, we were looking to donate to. We were able to get a sh quick shipment across and, and we rolled this out really to basically fundraise for Peter McBerry. And we were delighted with the response with this. Um, and it enabled us to help Peter McFerry Trust to actually continue a source of income for them. And also then we were able to engage with our suppliers, um, our supply chain to get them PPE, to get them all the other toiletry um, access and to work with them around the education piece for, the, for their clients to ensure that people who had already got um, a second home, um, that they stayed in that, that they had the education and they knew what to do so that they wouldn't fall back into homelessness and also that their essential services could continue and they, that people could access their care. So we were delighted with being able to pivot, I suppose, the way that we were fundraising for them so that we could continue to support them. The second part of your question, yes, I would be very concerned about um, I suppose, you know, what does COVID mean um, to people? Like, I mean, obviously from the helpline that we have set up, we see, we set that up in response to people being able to access their medicines initially, but actually probably one out of every three calls um, is around loneliness. Um, and we're referring more and more people to uh, the charity um, alone. Um, Unfortunately, we've had to refer people actually to Pieta House as well. Um, we're co in constant contact with people's families, um, our GP colleagues, the HSC as well. So, it, you know, we talked a lot this morning about collaboration. The collaboration has been the spirit of all of this. We have been solving problems that we never thought we'd ever have to solve before. So our role within community pharmacy has completely changed. It's not just about the provision of medicines, which people think that that's our role. It's actually so much broader than that. 
It's about the advice, the comfort and the education around how do people stay safe, make sure they protect themselves, protect their families. The simple things that Dr. Glenn talked about this morning, um, reinforcing that message each and every time and using the helpline, our website, our social media channels, our um, loyalty program to get that message out consistently to our patients and to their families. And, and, and then to educate them with, with what do they do if they're not feeling well? So if they're not feeling, you know, if they are feeling lonely, what resources are available to them? If they are feeling that they're not eating properly, what can they do? The simple steps that they can take. And you're right, like, you know, people are definitely staying at home. They're not exercising as much. What simple, and we've engaged actually with Emerald Warriors is another organization, great rugby um, uh, association we, we work with, and they have done online fitness programs for, for our team as well. So it's getting, it's finding out what are the key issues and then presenting a, a solution to each one of those. Yeah. Brilliant, and thank you very much. That's great work. I love the initiative around the keys. I think that's fabulous. I'd love to learn more about that yeah. offline. Okay. Fergal, just, just coming to you for a minute, I was watching TV last night and I saw that Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice have put on a socially distanced version of Jesus Christ Superstar in London. And I know you've been involved with some incredible initiatives in Galway to bring theatre back to the public. Can you just talk a little bit about that for a second? Yeah, I mean, um, thankfully, we had our first live audience on um, Wednesday evening and, and all went very, very well. 28 weeks since we had our last live audience in, in March. Um, so it was a little bit surreal. I mean, a lot of the same um, same clientele that we would have seen in March and they were immensely relieved and glad and they, they were just, they, they sort of felt, I suppose, enriched just to be gathering with people again in a safe manner. They, they self felt safe and comfortable. I mean, we, like everybody else, were kind of, uh, our world was turned upside down in March and we had to try and figure out how, how, this, how this was going to look for our industry. Um, and I think, you know, over the period of it, like everybody else, we figured out that this is here to stay and we're going to have to adapt and we're going to have to find a way to create work. And um, I think September 1st, I think, in our mind was a real turning point where we said we're going to have to focus on what we can do rather than what we can't do. We're going to stop focusing on, I suppose, uh, what it looked like uh, eight or nine months before and what's possible now. And thankfully, we put together a safe event. Um, we've got 12 actors. We've got 30 companies. So our, from an employment and business point of view, um, our business is back. It's, 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 it's not the same as it was before. It's a complete reset. Um, our original business model, I suppose, would have had two, two thirds income from uh, box office and corporate support. And, and that's essentially has fallen through the floor. But we just have to find solutions to be able to produce work in a safe manner. Um, and I suppose, uh, just on reflection, you know, it's, it's, it's probably shown the centrality of sport and arts to people's lives and to cities. I mean, I'm looking at, at New York at the moment and there, there was a lot of questions about, you know, is New York ever gonna be the same again? I absolutely think it will, but um, my own opinion is that until Broadway is back in New York, New York won't be the same. And business and, and the whole life of a city or a small town won't be the same again. So it's, it's absolutely crucial that we focus on what we can do and, um, and what we can do safely. Uh, to bring audiences back and, and, and make the best of this situation that we're in. Absolutely. Virgil, I think we'll hear more about New York coming back from Michael Dowling, who's one of our homegrown superheroes in the next session. And I'd urge you, if you haven't heard Michael speak, uh, to stay online. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal guy. Uh, the follow-up question, Virgil, and this is the last question, uh, and, and maybe some of the other panellists can give a view on this, but, you know, it seems when we have a combination of alcohol and youth together, you know, that that causes problems in terms of proliferation of the virus. And is that, a, is that a fair assessment? Because I know from my own college going kids who are not kids anymore, they resent that implication hugely. And they don't like taking the blame for this sort of revision or this phase two of the virus. Can you just talk a little bit about that, uh, Fergal? Because I know you and I have discussed this before about whether that's a fair assertion and whether we need to think about taking alcohol out of the equation in relation to social events to try and limit the, the spread of, of a second wave. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, since we were discussing before, I've been thinking about, you know, and, and have a look at some of the stats about younger people and uh, probably about our younger generation. And I think, you know, we have to ask ourselves on the leadership front and government front, why the message isn't getting through? Why is there a generation who are leading the way in terms of global warming and climate change? And the message may not be, you know, is not as conscious around COVID-19. Um, I, I heard Una Malali and Pat Leahy in the last couple of days talking about the use of influencers. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I do know that there's a large cohort of people that aren't listening to drive time every day. So we have to continue to examine and say, what is our message? Is it clear enough? And, um, and, and if it's not getting through, why is it not getting through? And what can we do about it? Um, I have absolute faith in young, um, educated, brilliant people. Um, I think we need to find a way where there's an absolutely established shared responsibility. I don't think that's from an entirely uh, rule-based um, piece where uh, everything is black and white. There's nothing, we figured that now, there's nothing black and white about this virus. Um, so I think um, in order to get the buy-in, we need to put the trust in young people because they're absolutely capable and they've proven that they're absolutely capable treating them um, like adults. And to be able to, um, I mean, we're on a journey. There's no point in, in any leader. Um, we've, we've, we've heard from the panels gone by. There's no leader that is just going to say, follow me or, or I'll follow you. It's going to have to, we're going to have to take people on a journey and say, we need everybody's buy-in for this, for your sake, for your parents' sake, for your grandparents' sake. Um, so I, I think there's, it's, it's a matter of, of putting the hand across the table saying um, we, need to, we need to work together on this, we need to uh, collaborate and, um, and it's, 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 it's life or death situation. So I, I think we need to look for buy-in rather than immediate answers. That's great, Fergal. I, look, I'm just, con before I, I'd love to get everybody's perspective on that question and other questions, Jordan, how am I doing for time? I think we're on, we think we're on schedule. Do, can I ask one more question or, or, or can, do you want to wrap yes, it up? Yes, we can ask one more question. Yeah, thank you, Liam. Well, I suppose it's the same question I asked the last panel and I thought I just was really taken by, uh, by the presentation Kathy Harvey gave earlier on on leadership and in a crisis and what's really important and the words, I thought it was really powerful, the sort of words that came out from people uh, both students in Said Oxford and indeed the people on the call this morning and those words were empathy, accountability and authenticity uh, on the student side and honesty, communication and empathy on, on, on the surveyed panel side. Are they the things that, that are important as leaders for the future as opposed to the more direct and control, more, I suppose, um, you, know, you, you know, the traditional, more traditional thoughts of what made leaders, great leaders in the past? And I'll come back to you on that and I'll try and take it in the same order that we did the last time. Uh, th thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, from the, the model we've taken is that um, it, we recognize the, the scale of the problem we had in COVID in particular. And we, what well, we did recognize that one of the greatest features of rugby is that it is a large family and uh, yeah. that it welcomes people of all shapes and sizes into its midst. And, what we did was we embraced that and we engaged all 120 unions and asked them to feed back what they were doing and the struggles they were having. We broke uh, the world's na the, the rugby playing nations up into five groups and we had them speak on a weekly basis and then fed back in centrally. So I think the we focused very much on the empathy side of this and in terms of the we're all in this together and let's let's pull together and make a shared resource that we can all we can all draw from, but that we all we're all actively contributing to as well. I think the and I think Fergal made a brilliant point a second ago about the, the youth and how we engage them, and that we see a, a youth movement around climate change and the strength of that movement. And I think part of part of 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 of, of some of the issues and the connection is that people feel disconnected at times from what's happening. I think a lot of young people may or may not feel that they have very much input into what's happening with why things are happening around COVID. And what we've found really helpful has been that engagement process. And it's not actually what you're giving back to people, it's what they are actively bringing to the piece that really engages them in the, in the entire process and makes them feel appreciated and involved in the situation. Fantastic. 
I, I, I'm going to take it in the same order and just ask you to be as brief as you can, given that we're under a bit of time pressure. So, Stephen, just your thoughts on what inspires us as, 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 as leadership of the future or in crisis? Yeah, I think I, look, I've been fortunate in my life. I've worked with probably two of the greatest leaders in, in, in Irish business and sport. I mean, uh, Philip Brown in, uh, in the IRFU and Michael O'Leary in Ryanair. You know, very different styles, but very clear and very uh, aligned actually with something that Fergal also mentioned earlier, which is that word values. And I think the values and the culture of an organization really are what brings through the leadership. And I think that's something that really uh, was hammered home again and again. A lot of the work that I did over the, the course of the, the MBA uh, with Murphy Business School, this, you know, knowing who you are and being authentic, including authentic voice in relation to that and communicating around those values and around that culture is in itself leadership. And I think if you have somebody at the top um, that fits your organization from a culture, then you've got the right fit, you've got the right leadership. And through that, you create uh, and inspire uh, people to believe in you. And I think that's really the value of leadership at, at a crisis. Yeah, that's spot on, Stephen, in my view. Uh, and any perspectives on, on, on inspiration yeah. and leadership from your perspective? Well, definitely. I think that the single biggest thing that we have um, really found huge value in is an engagement check-ins. So with our team, uh, just asking the four simple questions but that, that you would normally do in an engagement check-in, but actually adding that extra question, how are you doing? How, how's things at home? You know, almost getting a little bit more personal than what we would normally do. And I think that has shown our teams that we a care about them. It's back to empathy and compassion really, and yeah. being flexible with them. So that basically that we, they know that we care about them and we care about their home life and the balance that they have and the challenges that they have and that we trust them. It's back to trust for us. And that is the key thing in our organization. And I think when this is all over and done with, I think our teams will look at the people, um, leaders to say, did you care about me? Did you actually care about me? And I think our customers as well will think that as well. So like I'm always saying that to our teams, we need to make sure it's almost people before profits. Someone, someone else said it in the earlier, we put our people, our customers at the core of everything that we do. And if we do that, we'll do the right thing and everything else will follow. So for me, it's about empathy, compassion, and demonstrating, leading from the top that we care about our people and we care about our customers and everything else will follow. Brilliant. And, uh, it's very interesting. I think the sort of words that people seem to respect these days are humanity, humility, uh, and, and a big theme that came out again from Kathy's talk was self-doubt being valued, actually can be valuable in leaders, uh, even if it's expressed to their team, which was, was very radical thinking, because I think the, the old adage was you can never express self-doubt downwards or upwards in an organization. I think that, that was an important uh, lesson this morning from, from Kathy. I'm going to finish up with you, Fergal, on your thoughts. Um, you're leading a very dynamic and interesting uh, um, uh, organization in Galway. What, do you, what, what work works for you and what do you think people want to see from leaders? I think, I, I think what we said from the asset were that, were that from, from the start of March was the decisions you make in a crisis represent the organization you want to be after the crisis. Um, so, so your values, ha your decisions absolutely have to be aligned to your values. I think, you know, we have and rightly praised our frontline and healthcare workers in particular over the last six months. I think for the next six months, we need to see how we can take responsibility ourselves. There's so much industry expertise on this, on this panel, but all around the place saying, how can we make our workplace safe? How can we support our industry so that it still exists afterwards? How can we bring a little bit of light relief or entertainment or excitement to somebody's life? And rather than, I suppose, waiting for others to do it, we, we gotta, we've got to take the responsibility ourselves and, and bring that energy and excitement and expertise and innovation that, that, we, that we're used to, uh, to, to everyday life. And I think that's about making life uh, much more livable, much more bearable, much more enjoyable as we bet in for however long this road may be. Fantastic. Well, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish it up there in the interest of time. Thank you all very much. A really, really interesting and diverse perspectives on, on leadership and, and the challenges within your own uh, subsector of our society. Uh, thank you very much. And again, for all of you on, on, on the call, I'd encourage you to listen to Michael Darling next, who is one of our homegrown heroes who runs the biggest hospital group 
in the northeastern United States and has been at the front line of solving uh, a very, very difficult crisis in the New York area over the last couple of months. So thank you. And, and again, and I'll turn it back to you, Geraldine. Geraldine. Excellent. Thank you so much, Liam, and thank you to all of our panel members, um, to Aina, to Stephen, to Una and to Fergal um, for sharing your insights with us um, and your experience um, of the first phase of COVID and um, the, the significant role of sports, the arts and culture um, in our health and well-being. Um, and I, Stephen, I really liked the um, Tackle Your Feelings programme uh, that you talked about within the rugby community. Um, in addition to that, Una, uh, the work that you're doing with the Peter McVeary Trust in partnering with them um, is really inspiring. Um, that principle of a shared responsibility. Um, we reopened our campus here at the UCD Smurfit School two weeks ago um, with our new class of MBA and executive MBA students and all of our other students. Um, and we, we constantly uh, talked about the principle on which we were able to reopen our campus, which was that of shared responsibility. Um, it's inspiring to see that um, even though the sports and arts have gone through an incredibly difficult time, a time we could never have imagined um, for these sectors, um, that our leaders in these areas, Fergal, Aina, Stephen um, and Una, are optimistic for the future. They're realistic in terms of what we can do moving forward and how our business models and economic models for the sports and the arts worlds um, will change during this pandemic and, and moving into uh, the second phase. So thank you indeed, Liam, um, for a uh, superb chairing of those sessions, really inspiring um, from our leaders in, in those sectors.